John chapter 4 this morning, and I am sorry, I am burning up up here, so I don't know if it's just that hot or what, but uh, wow. Uh, so if it gets cold, I'm, I'm sorry about that, we'll see what happens. Uh, anyway, John chapter 4 is where we are this morning, and uh, we're going to pick up, for those of you who saw uh, anything from last week, um, uh, we, we, jumped, we jumped the story of the woman at the well, and we were talking about... Uh, the harvest, and we're going to jump back into the beginning of John chapter 4. We're going to talk about Jesus and the, and the woman at the well uh, this morning. And this morning our, our sermon title is Spiritual Food. Now we're um, a little past halfway into, into January, January uh, 19th, and uh, for those of you, this, this I'm not trying to be insulting, but if you have already crashed on your New Year's resolution that had to do with food, uh, I'm not trying to make fun of you at this time. Uh, I think this year my resolution is next year I'm going to make a resolution. That way I can, I'm going to hit it then. <clears throat> but in any case, the last several weeks, you know, as we came out of, out of Christmas and, and even uh, uh, just different events, uh, I have ate a bunch of junk food. I don't know about you guys, but I have ate so much uh, junk food that that it's that um, especially around Christmas time that I was I started to feel sick like I felt bad because I just keep eating junk food and I have little to no self control so if, if Katie makes cookies and they're sitting in the uh, in the in the, the cookie jar when I walk by the the kitchen this thing happens where a cookie lands in my hand I don't know how it happens exactly. <laughs> Uh, but it does, and uh, and and the other day we, she she was going through the deep freeze and she got some uh, some like cherries and I love a uh, cherry cobbler or, or a cherry pie and she made uh, she was just trying to get rid of some of this stuff and, and she made one and, and, and I accidentally ate the whole pie. Um, <laughs> don't know how that happened uh, actually, but but sometimes we just get so full on the junk food. And here we're going to take a look at what Jesus has to say about that. And we're looking, we're talking about spiritual food uh, in John chapter 4. And we'll, we'll pick up here in uh, verse 1, and we're going to read through 26. So John chapter 4, the scripture says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had, had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea, departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria, uh, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria uh, said to her, said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is uh, who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than the, our father Jacob, who, has, uh, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may, th may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you are now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and uh, you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you, will neither, uh, when you are neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. 
But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who, who speak to you am he. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you as we study the scripture, Lord, we just ask that you, Lord, that you just allow us to see the truth in these words, that you allow us to, to pursue truth in our life. I understand what I pray. Amen. So we're taking a look here, and, and again, we were talking about this, this spiritual food. Now, of course, Jesus here is, is, has, uh, is meeting with the, with the Samaritan woman, and I don't have to maybe explain this too much to you, but uh, Samaritans are, are really second-class citizens uh, to Jews, so much so that uh, Jews really aren't allowed to associate with them. And that, that's actually why when Jesus gives the, the parable of, of the Good Samaritan, that it was, it was so um, uh, a cross for the Pharisees, because it was the Samaritan who was doing this good deed, that, that everyone, uh, you know, with, with, with two brain cells to, you know, to rub together, would, would obviously say the Samaritan was, was the right, in the right there. And so we have this where, where he comes through, and, and the, the Samaritan woman knows this, and she knows that she is a, uh, in the eyes of the Jews, a kind of a second-class citizen, and, and so she, uh, she, she doesn't try to strike a conversation or anything, she, she's just going to do her business and, and move on. And Jesus says, hey, give me some water. And, 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 and the fact that he addresses, addresses her is, is uh, kind of uh, impressive enough. But, she go, but he goes on to say, if, if you knew who it was that was asking you this, you would ask me for some water, and you'd never thirst again. Now, of course, this woman, uh, she wants, that's a great deal. I, I, uh, you know, obviously, uh, every, every day, uh, I go into, the, into our kitchen, and, and we've got one of those refrigerators that has the, the little water and ice thing on it, and I, and I push the push the, you know, take my glass and I push it in there and I fill up with water and I get water. It is not hard for me to get uh, clean water. At any given time, you could open up our fridge and you probably have a couple of bottles of water. You could, uh, wa there is good potable drinking water uh, all the time. Almost everywhere I go here in Missouri, we have the option for good water. Where this lady, at this time, in order to get good water, you would have to travel, you know, almost every day if, if, if you... And then on, on the day of the Sabbath, you, you'd take more, so you wouldn't have to. But you would travel to the well outside the city, and you'd, and you'd fill up the, the, the jars that you, that you have, and you would carry them back. So the, the appeal, the physical appeal of this idea that I don't have to do this anymore was certainly there. The physical appeal of saying, you know what, you don't have to come out here every single day and do this. That's what, that's what drew her attention. Now, Jesus was never, in, 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 in intention or practice, was never going to make that a reality. He was never going to say, you never have to go to this well again. Because he was, up, of course, talking about this spiritual food. Now, throughout the Old Testament, we see this. We see, uh, we see uh, God speaking through means of food to his people. Think about with, with Moses uh, and the, uh, as they were wandering through the desert, that uh, they had manna uh, given down and, 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 and quail. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I try, so, in my life, here's a side story. In my life, I have killed exactly one quail. I'm afraid if God doesn't give them to me from heaven, I just don't think it's ever going to happen uh, for me. But that's a, you know, some conservation efforts maybe in, in line there. Uh, in any case, uh, but we look at this, and all through the Old Testament, we see this, this instances where, where God is physically offering food to the prophets, to his people, the people following him. Think about uh, Elijah uh, when, when he fled, and he's hiding out in the cave, and, and he's, he's weak, and he's tired. Actually, before he got to the cave, he's up by a tree, and he's weak, and he's tired, and, and he just wants to give up. And he wakes up, and there's, a, there's, there's food there, there's substance there given to him by God, and, and he takes that, and he carries on with his... With his journey, later on he is fed by by ravens. Uh, uh, think about uh, with the with the uh, with the with the lady who who only had enough flour. She was going to make one last 
loaf of bread and, and that her, her and her son uh, would, would then die and, and, and uh, God, God made that uh, extend and extend until they got through uh, the drought, whatever uh, calamity was going on there. But we see this, this time and time again, this, this real food, this manna from heaven. And so when Jesus comes down, he is, he's, he's carrying this, this theme, and he goes on with this theme to this, this spiritual food. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be in John chapter 6, and you're going to hear Jesus say that I am the bread of life. And, and that's one of the great I am's uh, of, of Christ that we'll get to, uh, you know, probably... Uh, middle of February ish uh, at that point in time, but we see this we see this food concept time and time and time again, and so here we have this this spiritual food, and and Jesus is talking to this this lady, and and he starts off by saying, "Do you never want to drink again? Do you never want to be thirsty?" Now here's the deal, Katie and I often have a, have a little fight. For some of you, you're going to be on different ends of the spectrum, but you'll probably understand the fight very quickly. When Katie and I go to either parent's house, it doesn't really matter which, uh, so I'll just say our parent's house, there is an immediate uh, discussion. Because the second, normally more, more so with my mother, but the second we walk into my parent's house, my children become hungry. I don't know if, if this happens at other grandparents' house, but the second it happens, they become hungry. And the second they become hungry, my mother makes them, you know, popcorn. They love popcorn. They or or, or fruit snacks or cosmic brownies or or rice krispie treats or any number of things that, that Katie and I are saying, hey, you're gonna you're gonna ruin your, your your supper, right? You're gonna you're gonna make it hard. And so we have this fight. My mom goes, Oh, Andrew, one little one won't hurt. And I'm like, where were you 20 years ago? <laughs> and if I walked through the house and grabbed a piece of bread before dinner, it was like fights on, right? But but whatever. Maybe, maybe you guys recognize that. Maybe you don't, I don't know. But uh, but we have this this issue. But Katie and I are responsible for our children in the respect that we need to make sure they eat good food. Yeah, right? We have to make sure. And so routinely, one of the sentences you'll hear, uh, and maybe this is unique to mid-Missouri, but one of the sentences you, you will hear in our family, in our house is, have you had any meat? Did you eat your meat? Right? Because uh, if, if we let the children decide what they want to eat, they'll eat all the, everything else, right? They'll, 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 they'll pick out uh, the, the less than, than good things for you to eat. In fact, just yesterday, we had a family fun day, and we went to... Uh, we went to Columbia, we had a big uh, breakfast before we left, and, and we went up there, and I just really wasn't that hungry, but, but the, the children got hungry, and so we went to uh, Dairy Queen or something like that, and, and, the, and the children had, a, and the children have gotten like a, a whatever, the, whatever the equivalent of a Happy Meal is uh, at Dairy Queen, and they got, you know, like a little hot dog and a, um, I don't know, chips and something. And, and they're all eating, and I said, I, I'm really just not that hungry. I'll just take a, and I got like a little dish of, of ice cream, and, and, and Lydia caught me and said, Dad, you didn't eat any meat. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell her, but I'm not sure she's eating meat with a hot dog. But anyway, sorry, that's, that's probably a bad joke. But, uh, but we, we've been training in this. And, and I look here at the church, and we look at this spiritual food, and using that analogy... But the fact of the matter is, in our churches all around, we are giving little more than spiritual junk food. All right, think about this. This is what I mean by the spiritual junk food. It's the appeasing part of the faith. It's the, it's the thing that gathers you in. Right? When Jesus does these miracles, and the miracles are phenomenal. They are a display of God's sovereignty. They are a display of God's power on earth. But, but the people who first follow, they got excited about the miracles. They got excited about the, 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 the stuff. But when Jesus got to a point where, okay, that was the, that was the, the appetizer. That was, uh, that was like what got you interested. But when it was time for the real food, that's when the people started falling apart. And you see what's happening in our churches today is that we are getting full day in and day out. On the spiritual junk food. It's all about what can God do for me? It's 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 the it's the the gospel of your best life today, right? It's 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 a social 
uh, you know, how do we become better people? How do we become, and, and don't get me wrong, if we follow the, the word, if we follow what the scripture says, we, we, we the, God's promises are not void. We were just reading our, in our Sunday school class where, uh, where Joshua has, uh, after, after Moses and and they, they've taken the promised land, and God told them, you're going to have all this land. And, and, and it wasn't overnight. They had to fight for it. They had to, they had to be uh, diligent and faithful to what God had did for them. And, 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 they, and they went on and conquered. And, and it says uh, there in, in, in chapter 23, it says that, uh, that they had peace in the land, that God had given them their rest just as he had promised. So, yeah, there is, there is tremendous promises in the scripture and we have the promise made to us that God uh, wills fulfill what he has promised us but the problem is, is that we don't like to do the hard work to get to the promise we don't want to do the hard work to get to that to, to, to the to, to the end we want the good stuff we want the miracles we want the we want the fluff when when Katie and I were, were dating uh, her parents took us to and they would do this uh, quite a bit, uh, but they would they would take us out to, to eat with them and and uh, and whatnot. And, and one of the places we went to is this this place I can't find it on a map if you try to get me there. But this place called Charlie's uh, Buffet. Maybe you guys know about it. Maybe not. Uh, everybody by the look of everyone said everyone knows about it. All right, so perfect. When someone tries to explain to you Charlie's Buffet, they never say the chicken legs are excellent. They never say the roast beef is great. They immediately go to, you got to see the desserts, right? They immediately go to, there's three tables of desserts. Uh, I remember as a, as a child, Robin Williams played in a, in a, a Peter Pan uh, movie. And, and when Robin Williams was, at, was in Neverland, when Peter Pan, they had this, this meal. And it was just full of color. And, and if, if you can remember that scene, you may, you may understand this. If you don't, then just work with me. But whenever I first went to Charlie's Buffet and I looked at that, I thought I just walked into Neverland. It was just, it was colors. You know, I didn't know there was desserts in so many different colors. And you got to try one of everything. At least I did. All right? But that's the junk food, right? The, 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 that's, the, that, that's, that's just the fluff. And in our churches today, we are so excited about the fluff. We're so excited about all the stuff. That we forget that we are that we need to pursue pure spiritual food, the good food, the milk, the meat. And I think one of the biggest issues there is that we have become so enamored with the fluff. We've been so enamored with the junk food that we don't know what the real food looks like anymore. We don't understand what true theology is looks like. Every single Sunday when I come up here, I, I try my very best to give you true spiritual food. What, what real theology from the scriptures means. And sometimes that might be a little hard to hear. Sometimes that might mean it's stepping on some toes. Sometimes, but you know what? Look at what Jesus does here. When, he, when he's talking to this woman, he, he tells about this spiritual food, this, this, or this, this drink in this case, and, and, and she's like, I'm excited. And so what does he do? He says, go, go, go to your husband, get him, and come back and talk to me. And she goes, I, I, don't, I don't have a husband. And Jesus goes, I know. You are truthful. You don't. You've had five husbands. And the, the guy you're, you're, you're living with right now, he's, he's not your husband. So I appreciate you being honest. See, that's where the that's where the real meat came from. And you might have missed it if we just breezed through the story, but that's where the real meat came from because at this point in time, Jesus is confronting her, convicting her of her actual sin. One of the things that we seem to forget in our, in our junk food only churches of today is that we have sin in our life and sin by definition creates separation from us and God. All right, all the way back to when, when we first started talking about this with, with, with Adam and Eve, right? When, when God first created it, he said, you can eat from anything you want. You just walk around and grab fruit off the trees. You can, you can eat whatever you want. Don't eat off the one tree, but it's all yours. And immediately, at least very, very, very soon after that, we have sin. And what happens with that sin is a separation where God says, I'm sorry, you're cast out. 
from now on, you're going to have thorns in the ground that you have to work with your hands and, 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 and uh, labor and childbirth and enmity with your children. And all this, all the sin that we deal with today. Now, I wonder what this woman was thinking, because you see, I don't know how big this town was, but I do know how small towns work, because that's all I've ever lived in. One day I was at O'Reilly, I was putting uh, sea foam into my, into my lawnmower, I was having a hard, it was early spring, I was having a hard time getting the thing started, so I was dumping that, uh, that, that sea foam in, and, and I didn't, I didn't uh, mix it or anything, I was just like dumping it straight in there to try and get it to, uh, to clean things out. And this guy saw me, and, and he comes up, and he, 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 he believed that I was making some uh, failure uh, uh, with this. And, and so he's trying to help me. He said, hey, you really shouldn't do that. You should do this. And, and he's, he's a nice guy. He's trying to help me out. And, uh, and we get to talking a little bit. And, uh, and, and he asked who I was, and I said my name. And he didn't, I didn't recognize anything and, and uh, somehow figured out that I worked at Martin Angel. I might have had a shirt on. I don't honestly remember how, that, how he got there. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. You're that guy who's building that house over there by the park, right? Because it's a small town, and, and, and there's this physical thing happening. There's like one house built every two years, so it's kind of big news. Um, and, and, and he immediately knew who I was. He knew who my parents were. He knew who my brother was. He knew, he knew everything about me because he figured it out. And so I wonder if this woman at the well uh, was kind of thinking the same thing. Like, who have you talked to? Who have you talked to that knew that I had these five husbands? Who have you talked to that knows that I'm living with this other, like, we, we don't mention the man, we don't mention the, the, the woman's name here, but, but you've got to wonder if that's what she's thinking. And how easy would it have been for her to go, you know what, mind your own business. How easy would it have been for her to say, hey, just think about if that happened in today's time, to, to, to look around and say, you know what, don't judge me. That's, that's my favorite one, don't judge me. Mind your own business. Keep to yourself. And yeah, that would have been very easy for us to do. And what happens in our churches today is that we, that we have got to confront sin. But as us, as members of the church, myself included, that whenever sin is confronted to us, we have to accept it as saying, you know what, I need to work on that. You're right, biblically speaking, that is incorrect, and I should fix that in my life. Instead, we react with the most visceral reaction we can. We, we jump up and down. We say, don't judge me. Don't tell me. And I'm never coming back. I'm going to go find the next church. I'm going to go find the next one. This is not, as I say often, don't hear what I'm not saying. This is not an open invitation to go to your neighbor and just start pounding on them for their sin. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the invitation here. But as we study the scripture... When we look at what the scripture says, what gives us that pure spiritual food is to take a look, to take a look at what the Bible says and how it aligns to our life. And if our life is not aligned with the Bible, the, the life is what we have to change. Not the Bible, not the, not the, the theology of the church, not anything. Well, we have to change to, in, in accordance with what the scripture says. That's what it means to desire pure spiritual food. That's what this lady did. Jesus convicts her of her sin. He says, look at what you're doing wrong. Listen, we have had too much fluff in the church as a whole. The most poignant example I can give you, and this is, this is kind of an embarrassing story, but, uh, but when I was probably about Jacob's age, uh, the Chiefs were playing in the, in the AFC Championship game. Joe Montana was the quarterback. They played at the uh, at the Bills. I remember so much of it. Don't ask me why. And we were losing. And I remember getting very upset that we were losing. And at the time, obviously, uh, living in my parents' house because I was you know, just a little kid. And and, uh, and I went into my, my bedroom. And in my bedroom, we had a, uh, you know, of course, grew up in a, in a very Catholic home. And I had a little uh, a cross, a crucifix, you know, a little you know, Jesus on it and everything. And I got so mad that we were losing. And I, and, and, and I prayed to God. I said, God, well, we got to win, right? Like, I asked God for us to win this game, and, and we weren't winning. And so you know, I, I did the only thing that, the, the, what an eight-year-old boy could do at the time is, is I picked up that cross, and I, and I flipped it over, and I shoved it under the bed. I was going to punish God for the Chiefs losing. Now, the fact of the matter is that is, that is absolutely crazy. And I am so glad that spiritually I have matured from that point. <laughs> You guys are laughing. You think maybe I haven't matured. <laughs> okay. 
That's true. Uh, I, am, I am pretty immature. But the fact of the matter is, I think that's how we approach our Christianity. I think that that's part of that spiritual junk food. We pray to God as if we're preaching to the genie. We say, God, I need healing. And the healing doesn't come, and that affects our faith. We pray, God, we say, I need, I need a, a better job or a better whatever. And when those things don't happen, it affects our faith because we are driven by the miracle. We are driven by the, the, the very thing that Jesus in the Scriptures is fighting against. Look at what he says. Look at the words of Christ when he says, you guys demand a miracle. You demand these things, and you demand because you have, as the Scripture says, an adulterous heart. Your relationship with God is composed primarily of what God will do for you and how you will become a better, uh, have a better physical existence because of your, 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 your approach to Christ. That is spiritual junk food. The true meat. The true meat. And this is why, I, and I have prayed so much. I have prayed for healing uh, in, 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 in some things in, in my own life, some, some, some very close personal friends. I've got, a, I've got a young boy that I have been praying for for uh, 20 years for healing. And he hasn't healed. I just say, man, God's going to get the glory one way or the other. God's going to get the glory. And that is hard. That is hard. It's so hard to understand why do all these bad things have to happen because if we're all we're doing is looking at the good parts of life, if we're looking at all that fluff, it's just the junk food. Guys, we have got to pure, we have got to we got to <coughs> desire pure spiritual meat. And that meat comes in the very last sentence. The woman makes the confession, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he's gonna explain everything to us. So she, she, she's aware of it. She knows that this better thing is coming. And what does Jesus do? He looks right at her and says, The one you're speaking to, I am he. He tells her straight up, I am the Messiah. I don't know what happens with this woman. Because obviously the scripture is all about Jesus, right? The scripture is all about pointing us to the cross, pointing us to our resurrection, pointing us to, to how we can do that. I, 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 I wonder... I wonder if this lady followed after that. I wonder if this lady was was wandered around and, and, and saw those signs. I wonder if she was maybe one of the five thousand. I don't know. Probably not, because of, because even though Jesus gives her this, she she was still a Samaritan and still would have been very much looked down upon. But we don't know. We don't, I don't see the I don't see what the scripture says. I wonder. If she, I wonder if she was there when, when she saw Jesus crucified. I wonder if she was there. And she, obviously, we, we have no reason to believe that Jesus' resurrection, post-resurrection body uh, appeared to this woman so she would have maybe heard that this person had conquered death. I wonder what she, I just wonder. Because by all accounts, she had a, a true life change upon meeting her Savior. And from that point on, she was desiring that pure spiritual food. The good stuff, not the fluff. See, at some point, faith must take off. And what faith is, the, the, the very substance of it is, is that, is that believing in what we don't quite understand, that, 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 that absolute belief in these very difficult, difficult to understand things. We can't explain it all. We have to pursue that pure spiritual food. So my question to you is, where are you this morning? Are you tired of the junk food? Are you ready for the pure spiritual meat? You got some sin in your life that, that you know, obviously with this woman, her conviction point was 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 over uh, her marriages and, 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 and how many and, and who she's living with right now. And, got, and Jesus convicted, she, he went right at her sin. Maybe you got some sin in your life this morning and you're, and you're, and you're fighting with it. Man, Jesus already knows it. And not only does Jesus already know it, he's already paid the price for your sin. And what we have to do in our lives is to understand that that price was paid. We're never going to earn it. We're never going to earn anything. But we absolutely had better become a new creation and try our very best to live in that process of sanctification, that process of getting closer and closer to God until the day we die when we get to see him face to face. Guys, where are you? 
this morning. Our closing song.